The Millennium, a prophetic forecast by Johanna Brandt. Chapter 5, The Second Period, Temporal, The Triumph of the Church, The Fall of Paganism in Europe. Except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Mark 13 verse 20 Constantine the Great was the only child of a marriage of pure love. His father, Valerius Constantius, was an officer in the Roman army whose brilliant military career prepared the way to an exalted political station, and he was elevated to the rank of Caesar in 293 AD. Nearly 300 years had passed since the ascension of Jesus Christ, and the persecution of the Christians under the Roman emperors was raging with unabated fury. It was even dangerous for a leader of the people to exhibit signs of tolerance and mercy to the oppressed. And the fact that Constantius, during his brief reign, protected the Christians as far as he dared, instantly stamps him as the man of moral courage and independent thought. On his sudden death, his son Constantine was proclaimed Augustus of the West in the year 306 AD. It was a time of extreme danger and mighty upheavals in the Roman Empire. The state was racked and torn by internal dissensions between the various political rulers who waged deadly warfare against each other in their aim at supremacy. The people groaned beneath the yoke of an unparalleled tyranny. Under the Emperor Galerius and two minor rulers, Severus and Maximus, who were all heathen worshippers of the most pronounced and fanatical type, there was a fresh outburst of persecution against the Christians, in which the church was threatened with final extinction. Only in the West, where Constantine reigned, there was peace and safety from the storm. But already, many eyes were turned in his direction. Many merciless plans were laid out for his undoing. Knowing that Maxentius, the tyrant of Upper Italy, was preparing to attack him in his own domain, Constantine decided to frustrate his plans by marching on him unexpectedly with his little army of 40,000 men. But Maxentius was ready for him and advanced to meet him with 120,000 men. Humanly speaking, the noble Constantine was now lost and this he fully realized in the calm that preceded the storm. He called upon his gods for deliverance, and in his despair he besought the god of his father, Mithra, the sun god, whom he worshipped as the highest being, to reveal to him the sign under which he should undertake the conflict. Suddenly, while he was in the fields with his army, the sun was slowly sinking in the west. He saw a light cross on the sun, and beside it, on the clouds in blazing letters, the words, In hoc signo, vinces, under this sign thou shalt conquer. Amazed and shaken, he spent that night in torturing uncertainty and fitful dreams. And then it was that the vision was continued by the appearance of the Christ himself, who commanded him to go forth under the sign of the cross and in his name and strength. There has never been the slightest doubt in history of these visions, and Eusebius, the great church historian and friend of Constantine, declares that he had the story of the heavenly token from his own lips, while Lactantius, 
describes the vision of the night at length. The God of the persecuted Christians had revealed himself to Constantine as the only God. And to his service, Constantine then and there dedicated his life. He had the sign of the cross placed on his helmet and on his soldiers' shields. A banner adorned with the same token preceded the small army in the unequal contest. And he achieved marvelous victories in Italy until Maxentius, the mighty ruler, lost his life in the decisive battle at Pons Milvius on October 28, 312 AD. The road was now open to Rome, and Constantine marched triumphantly into the city with his victorious army, where he was hailed as deliverer and as emperor of the entire West. With a man like Constantine, no half measures were possible. Openly and fearlessly, he professed his faith in the crucified Nazarene as the only Son of God. And one of the first things he did as emperor was to erect a statue of himself on a public square in Rome, with a cross in his right hand, on which the words were engraved, By this salutary token, which is the true sign of faith, I have delivered your city from the yoke of tyranny. This proof of his gratitude to God, which is to be seen in Rome to this very day, worked secretly and irresistibly on the minds and emotions of a superstitious race. Slowly, but surely, the influence of that silent witness spread. Imperceptibly, the true significance of those words grew on the heathen people, to whom outward signs and visible symbols formed an indispensable part of worship. The cross became the highest object of veneration, at the shrine of which the idolaters now bent the knee. And Constantine, with the penetration which marks his entire career, made the most of his salutary token. The new symbol became the object of brilliant exhibition in the Labarnum, the sumptuous banner of the cross, whose shaft was crowned by the monogram of Christ, encircled with the golden chaplet of unsurpassed splendor of design, which excited the admiration of the world. Gradually, the sign of the cross became the accepted token under which the most impressive heathen ceremonies were conducted, while in private life, in countless homes, the same sign became an object of worship and veneration. From the worship of an object, it is not a far step to the worship of the ideal, which it represents and the Christian teachings came in for a share of the newborn public interest. Spurred on by the example of their noble leader, whom they loved and venerated with the passionate enthusiasm of an imaginative race, the people made a study of the Christian faith and Christian history. From the lives and teachings of the Christians in their midst, while Constantine, under the direct guidance of the Church Fathers, devoted himself ardently and humbly to the study of the Scriptures. By the law of recoil, the fate of the crucified Nazarene and his martyred followers, when examined in the new light, struck to the very heart of the people a complete revulsion of feeling was slowly but surely taking place. It could not be otherwise. It was inevitable. With those tangible proofs around them of the literal fulfillment of Constantine's heavenly vision, the yoke of tyranny had indeed been lifted. The oppression under which the people had labored for so long had been relieved 
and in the mighty empire, peace and prosperity were established at last. And every eye was fixed on the gigantic figure, the powerful personality of the man through whom this had been achieved. The first step he took in the protection of the Christians was to abolish their death by crucifixion, which had for centuries been the most universal method of execution. And this one can appreciate in the marvelously beautiful story of his conversion, in which the sign of the cross had become to him the most exalted, the most sacred, the most holy symbol of faith. With other, more drastic changes in the empire, he had to be more circumspect, especially where public amusements and religious ceremonies were concerned. The scenes of carnage in the amphitheatre of Rome's vast Colosseum had become well-established institutions, which could not be broken down without grave danger of shattering the empire. The rights of Greek and Roman paganism could not be attacked by violence. There were insurmountable barriers which made compulsory procedures impossible. Constantine realized all this with a keenness of perception and insight which can only be described as superhuman. He knew that the vast majority of his empire was still heathen. He understood that in the government, in the army, and among the upper classes, the entire fabric of the ancient worship stood intact. He realized the power and influence of the priesthoods, with their rich endowments of legal rights and properties. Although his highest purpose, from the moment of his conversion, seems to have been the conquest of Greek and Roman heathendom by Christianity, he grasped the dangers of the religious and political situation with unerring judgment and knew instinctively that violent methods would be fatal. He had watched the effects of Christian persecution to some purpose. And with profound political insight, he resolved to avoid the pitfalls into which his predecessors had fallen. He would reach his goal and free the world from paganism by the tedious way of small things and small results. And more than once, he withstood the temptation to use his power by driving methods when instinct and conscientiousness warned him that the people should be led. In his policy of prudence and toleration, which was indeed from the first a policy of breaking down by building up, of crowding out the evil by replacing it with something high and noble, there was never any room for the promotion of his personal aims above the common good. Constantine regarded his calling from on high. As emperor, he was no more than a human instrument in the hands of his sovereign lord. He set himself to the development of his inborn mystic faculties, the better to hear the divine voice, the better to carry out the divine will. And the results were stupendous, altogether beyond the grasp of human comprehension. Within three months after the defeat of Maxentius, when Constantine observed that the public attitude was favorable, he proclaimed his famous edict of toleration at Milan, 313 AD by which was bestowed on every subject in his empire, Greeks, Romans, Christians, Jews, and heathens, full liberty and perfect freedom of religious belief, 
protected by law. Let us pause for a moment here. It seems to me that there has never been a more critical instance in Christian history than the point we have now reached. The Edict of Toleration, which made the persecution of Christians punishable by law, at the same time protected the rights and freedom of the heathen people. It placed every subject of the Roman Empire on the same footing of liberty and equality. It promoted harmony between the discordant elements of a storm-wracked state. It rose like an unassailable monument of wide-minded protectiveness out of the surrounding disorder of hate and jealousy. It opened the road to Christian development, which had been barred so long. In short, the Edict of Toleration in a single instant saved the Church of Christ. If Constantine, in his policy of furthering Christian interests, had ranged himself with violence against his former fellow believers, they, driven by the instincts of self-preservation, would have resisted him powerfully, and the conflict, instead of being ended, would simply have assumed a new and deadly character. But this attitude of moderation instantly disarmed the public mind, poured the oil of security on the seething waters of long-endured subjection. More than ever, he became the hero of the hour, the darling of the people. He had the mighty Roman Empire at his feet. Its fabulous wealth was at his disposal. His power and influence for good or evil, as its emperor, extended and spread beyond all bounds. In the dazzling splendor of his court, Christians and heathens and Jews were all made equally welcome. The emperor did not withdraw himself from outward pagan customs, but maintained his position as high priest and, even as all his predecessors, consciously fulfilled his duties in the gorgeous and impressive public religious ceremonies of his day. But it is noticeable that on these occasions he addressed himself only to the highest God and scrupulously avoided those rites which were in conflict with the teachings of his newfound faith. He appreciated the value of imperial dignity, knowing that it would be another bond between himself and his pomp-loving subjects. And nothing was more familiar to them than his stately, handsome presence. But above all, he swayed the people by the force of his moral integrity, overawed them by the reality of his prophetic vision, which had been divinely thrust upon him and them, in such a manner that it could not possibly be ignored. The remembrance of it ruled his life. In an age of unbridled licentiousness, he imposed the loftiest moral requirements for himself and others. So much so that he did not spare his eldest son, Crispus, from the extreme penalty, death, by execution, for a serious breach in this direction. This violent outburst revealed the last slumbering remains of heathen abandonment in Constantine, and nearly broke his mother's heart, but was not without effect on the purity of his court. Constantine the Great was the greatest diplomat, the finest social and religious reformer, the most practical statesman, the profoundest mystic of Christian history. There were others after him who excelled in various directions. Constantine excelled in them all, and he possessed 
in addition to his natural powers, the inestimable advantage of social standing and high rank, and of unbounded wealth. It was quite natural that Constantine, after his conversion, should never have felt quite at ease in ancient Rome, with its pagan traditions and customs, and that he should have decided to build a new city of surpassing loveliness in which to establish his own residence. Hence arose on the banks of the Bephorus the marvelously beautiful city of Constantinople, in which no room could be found for heathen temples and pagan images, but which was abandoned, but which was adorned by the graceful spiral towers of many costly Christian churches. Here a Christian court was formed, in the splendor of Constantine's new palaces. Here gorgeous monuments arose to the memory of martyred saints and heroes. Here extensive museums were filled with priceless works of art from ancient Greece and Italy. And here, in public parks and gardens, nature was allowed to run riot in all her profusion and luxuriance under the blue sky. With his unusual, irresistible diplomacy, Constantine bestowed vast estates in and around the city on Christian families to lure them into his domain, with the result that in time Constantinople became a center of Christianity. A second capital, based on purely Christian principles, in the heart of a heathen empire. <laughs>